All right, hello again. We're going to continue with Chapter 8, talking about uh, rotation, and continue on with Section 2. And so last time we talked about a lot of vocab words, including angular displacement, angular velocity, angular acceleration. Now we're going to talk about how to change angular velocity. So if you think about when you're opening a door, you know, what's the easiest way to open it? Or what factors control how much force you have to apply to open the door? Well, you exert a force as far from the axis of rotation as possible. So if you think about the axis of rotation as being the hinges, you've got your doorknob way on the other side, and that's where you're exerting the force. Okay, so your doorknob is at a right angle and as far away from that axis of rotation as possible. And so if you want to change angular velocity, you need to control the magnitude of the force, so how, how hard are you pulling on the doorknob, uh, the distance from the axis to the point where the force is exerted, so that would be like from the hinges to the doorknob, and then the direction of the force as well. And those things can be used to change the angular velocity. If you think about a door and you put the doorknob in the middle of the door, it'd be a lot harder to open it than it would if the doorknob was on the very end. Or even if you move the doorknob right next to the hinges, it'd be really hard to open. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. I never thought about that before. Okay, well, the door works the same way as what is called a lever arm. And so a lever arm is perpen the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is exerted. And so on this picture, that is this red dashed line right here. Here's our force, um, this black arrow. It's also drawn again in this dashed line. And then we've got our axis of rotation. And so our lever arm is this perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation um, to that point where the force is exerted. And so we can use an equation to find this, which is r times sine of theta where r is the distance from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is exerted. And so that's this red arrow here, directly from the axis to the point of the force, whereas the lever arm is just the perpendicular. Um, and then theta is the angle between the force and the radius, and that's why the force is also drawn here. Um, so we've just transcribed it so that we can measure the angle. Okay, well, when we're talking about uh, rotating motion and applying a force, we're also going to talk about torque. So torque, which is this um, Greek symbol, kind of looks like a, a smaller uppercase T with a curve. Um, so torque is a measure of how effectively a force causes rotation. And we can solve for torque by taking the force times the radius times sine of theta. And the units of torque are, because we have force and radius, are newton meters. So to find net torque, um, now they give this experiment, so I tried it, but of course couldn't get it to work correctly. So they want you to take a penny, um, or tape a penny to each end of a pencil, and then balance it on another pencil. But my problem was I could not get it to, to balance, of course. Yeah, see, it just wouldn't work. Um, and I could probably mess with it. It probably worked better if you had pencils that weren't completely round, the ones that kind of are what hexagonal in shape. It probably worked better. But basically what you're doing is you're putting weights on either end of this pivot point, or this rotational axis. So if we look at each penny, the torque of each penny is just the force times the radius. Because they're both in this straight line, we're going to say that you know the angles are maybe 0 and 180, which would come out to the same. Um, and so it's just the weight of the penny, which is the force due to gravity, times the distance. And so these torques are equal and opposite if it's balanced, which means that the net torque is 0. Now what if you wanted to make that pencil rotate? Okay, you would have to change one of those factors in order to get that to happen. And so you'd have to change the force on one penny, so you'd have to add more pennies to one side than the other, or you would have to change r, which is the distance from the pivot point. So you'd have to slide your bottom pencil, instead of it being in the center, you'd have to slide it to one side or the other to get your uh, pencil to rotate around the other one. And so that's what's kind of going on up here. So uh, they're using a ruler, and yet they've got the hexagonal pencil, which makes things easier. Um, but all I had were round ones. And so they've got more pennies on one side than the other, and then they've also changed the pivot point, and you can see that the distances are different. And so that's how you're going to get it to rotate. Okay, so we can also talk about objects' resistance to rotation. So just like in linear motion, objects resist a change in their motion. Same qualifies for rotational. So if we go back to that penny experiment, if I take my two pennies and they're balanced on the ends and I rotate it like 
back and forth in my fingers. It takes a little bit of force and a little bit of torque to do that, but, but not very much. But now if I move them closer to the center, or closer together, okay, something like this, and then I rotate it, it's a lot easier to do so. And so this means that less force and less torque is required when the coins are closer together. And so mass isn't the only factor that affects the moment of inertia. Distance matters too. And the closer those objects are to each other, the less torque I have to apply to get them to move. And so the moment of inertia with a uh, symbol as a capital I is the resistance to rotation. And so we can solve for that by taking the mass times the radius squared. And so our units, because we're working with mass and distance, are going to be a kilogram meter squared. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this mass, uh, or this moment of inertia. So if you think about a bike tire, almost all the mass on that bike tire is distributed to the outside, right, where the, the tube is. And so for that bike tire, the moment of inertia is almost equal to the mass times the radius squared. But not every object has all of its mass distributed to the outside. Lots of other objects have mass distributed continuously, and this affects their moment of inertia. Cylinders, for example, have a moment of inertia of one-half mr squared. Uh, solid spheres have an I equal to two-fifths mr squared. And I don't think that these equations are necessary to memorize. We're just looking at how the mass is distributed and how that's affecting the moment of inertia. The location of the rotational axis also matters, so the invisible axis that the object's going to rotate around. So, for example, if you took your physics book and you held it at the bottom and you tried to rotate it, I mean, it requires a lot of force and torque to do that and not um, throw the book into the laptop. But if I hold the book in the center and I rotate, it's really easy to rotate it. Okay, and so that position of the rotational axis is also going to have a determining factor on the moment of inertia. And so the reason it takes less torque to rotate it when I'm in the middle is because the average distance of the mass from the rotational axis is less. The rotational axis is where I'm holding it, and then I have less mass on either side. Versus, like if I was holding it at the bottom, and now I've got a lot more mass going around my, my axis of rotation. Okay, well this can also relate to Newton's second law for rotational motion. We know that Newton's second law in linear is the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. We can also do that with rotational motion. So for linear, acceleration is F net over M, so directly related to force, inversely related to mass. Well, if we replace our linear acceleration with our angular acceleration, if we replace force with torque and mass with moment of inertia, um, then we get that angular acceleration is directly proportional to torque, and inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. And so we can get a new equation with our rotational, oh, I forgot where this thing was, with our rotational variables versus our linear variables. Okay, so to spin a pencil or change the direction of the rotation, we need to give an angular acceleration. And to do this, we need to apply torque. And so the greater the moment of inertia, the more torque that is needed, and these are the two factors that are going to affect your rate of rotation. Okay, so because my moment of inertia was pretty low, I'm easily able to rotate this. But if I change the distance or I change the mass, then I'm going to need more torque and I have more, a larger moment of inertia. Okay, so there are quite a few practice problems for this section. I don't know if we'll do all of them, but we're at least going to hit on different types of examples. And then um, this is the homework that we're going to do. And the answers should be on your outline. Have a good day.